Welcome to episode 25 of the G2 on 5G. It's everything related to 5G. We cover six topics in about 15 minutes and it's brought to you by More Insights and Strategy. I'm Will Townsend and joining me again this week is Angel Sai. So let's get started with my first topic. Nokia uh, predicts an $8 trillion uh, effect on global GDP by 2030 as a result of 5G private networking. Um, they commissioned a study, um, and so that was that was released this week. I actually commented and you know provided some insight on Twitter. That's a pretty aggressive number, but when you look at you know what they're talking about, they're they're looking at how 5G and that modality is going to transform different industrial sectors. And we've talked about Industry 4.0 on our podcast in the past, and you know I would say it's an aggressive number, but I'd say you know at the same time it, it's theoretically realistic as well. What, what are your thoughts, Angel? So I think 2030 is too soon. Yeah. Um, I think that's really the, the, my issue with the number. Um, I think Qualcomm had a study that came out a year or two ago that said like 40 something trillion dollars will be okay. generated by 5G as a whole, Yeah. Um, including private 5G. I forget what date, but I don't think it was 2030. I think it was much less aggressive. Yeah. Um, I would say 2035 maybe makes more sense. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's totally reasonable because I think if, if you really understand the potential of 5G, then you know that um, there's a lot more potential on the, on the inf infrastructure um, industrial side than there is in the consumer just because it's so untapped. Right. Uh, and there's a massive um, delta in terms of connectivity that's needed and what's available um, in terms of price, cost, speed, uh, availability, all of those things can be solved with 5G private networking when implemented properly. And I think the eight trillion number is very reasonable. Yeah, no, about no, 10 years exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, it's also interesting, you know, it's no secret that Nokia is leading the charge, you know, amongst its big infrastructure peers uh, with respect to private networking uh, through their Nokia Enterprise division. So um, this, this is probably an attempt to put some, some further sales, uh, wind in their sales actually, yeah. um, and, and drive that forward. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that pans out. But let's get into iPhone. Big announcement this week, right? And there was a lot of marketing hype from the operators leading up to it, especially in the US. So I think you wanted to share some insight there. Yeah, so I have a prop. Um, I've got the Betty Crocker prop. So it's yes. a very strong lighting. So you might not be able to see it very clearly, <laughs> but this is a uh, cake mix that T-Mobile sent a bunch of press and analysts Brilliant. Uh, leading up to the iPhone event, which is on Tuesday. I got this on Monday. Mm -hmm. Some press got there on Friday and Saturday, but this is a 5G layer cake that kind of um, shows a visual uh, illustration of what they can do uh, with their 5G spectrum across three different bands. Um, but they weren't alone in their marketing. Um, you know, there was some pretty heavy marketing from Verizon. They were actually on stage at the iPhone event. And that's when they decided to launch their nationwide 5G network, which uses dynamic spectrum sharing uh, with 4G to give 5G coverage, but doesn't really improve speed significantly. Yeah. Um, and I think that's also why Apple, um, which I'll talk about in my next topic, um, also had... Um, some interesting um, features in the new iPhone that switch between 4G and 5G and a bunch of other things that um, were interesting. But the key was Verizon CEO was on stage and made the announcement of the new network. And um, I think someone did a super cut on Twitter of all the times 5G was mentioned during the <laughs> Apple uh, event and it was 72 times. Nice. <laughs> Well, Apple is uh, is finally at the uh, has a seat at the, the 5G table, right? So it's they're about a year behind, you know, uh, the others in the market. But you know, kind of given where deployments are, you know, I think Apple, right, was was pretty adamant about this. They didn't yeah. think that that was going to be a huge and, issue. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later. But um, I'll get into more detail about the new iPhones capabilities. But um, the, the marketing was very aggressive, and there's a reason for that. Um, but I was kind of curious what your take was on the marketing, at least from the carriers. You know, th there's some promotions that we'll also talk about in my next topic. But um, yeah. in terms of marketing leading up to the, to the event, what, what were you thinking? 
Um, it's, you know, it didn't surprise me. Um, we knew there'd be a lot of fanfare around it. Um, I think, you know, you'll, you're the device guy. So, you know, when you get into your second topic, you'll talk about the form factors like the mini as an example. But, um, but I thought the marketing was brilliant. I, I think T-Mobile did a brilliant job. You know, I'm on a keto diet right now, so I've got to wait to bake my cake. I know, I'm not baking so. mine. My, 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 um, my rule that people were asking me, like, are you going to bake it? I was like, I'll bake it once T-Mobile has all three layers of the cake in San Diego. I love it. I love it. That's cool, man. Well, I'll, I'll save mine once I, I, I drop a few more pounds. So let's, let's shift to my second topic this week. And um, AT&T announced that the, the, their first net, um, first responder network is extending to the U.S. Army. 70-something um, uh, locations, um, I'm assuming, you know, it's obviously in the U.S., and you know what's what's interesting about FirstNet? I've been following this. If you kind of look back at how you know Motorola sort of ruled the roost, you know, back in the early days, you know, having you know almost sort of a proprietary technology, right, uh, that used you know obviously Spectrum um, in police cars. And you know now FirstNet, the reason why you know it's been deployed is that with that sort of siloed sort of approach in, in sort of the Motorola, Motorola ecosystem, it was difficult to connect those first responders in real time to hospitals and, you know, care facilities and, and, and that sort of thing. So first that's really extended that, you know, that, that, that capability and that communication capability, um, connecting all the dots there. But I think it's interesting the US Army is adopting this and I think there could be you know, sort of real advantages for, you know, on, on a number of fronts. I'm, I'm curious to get your intake on that. Yeah, it's interesting because FirstNet wasn't originally originally designed for um, the military, right? It was for right. first responders, um, but it's still a very reliable, dependent, you know, um, network. I, I, think it's, I think it's very reasonable for the military to use FirstNet. Mm -hmm. um, I think my concern is whether or not um, the military may because of the size of the military um, could impede um, first responders ability to use that network effectively mm -hmm. um, and you know have unfrouded, unencumbered spectrum. Yeah. Uh, so I think it'll be important to make sure that that doesn't happen um, because you know it is only certain, it's a limited amount of spectrum right. um, that, that at and has there. Um, and I'm really curious to see how you know moving that over to 5G, and leveraging that for 5G is going to potentially, you know, make it more uh, flexible and yeah. uh, have a better quality of service. I think it would, um, because obviously, you know, 5G can support more devices. It's it's low. It's you know has power management capabilities that exceed that of LTE. And when I think about it, you know, think about, you know, once they can deploy 5G, you know, within FirstNet then you can start doing things like real time, you know, video, high resolution video from an ambulance as an example, back to a hospital so that you can be doing a better job of uh, preparing triage and, and that sort of thing. So, and I think the applications could be interesting for the military as well, but to your point, yeah, I'm a little concerned, you know, is that, is that gonna crowd out the first responders? But, you know, I guess time will tell, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, well, let's move on to your second topic. It's the 5G iPhone. Yeah, so iPhone event happened this week. Um, today is actually pre-orders, but people are pre-ordering their phones today. Um, and basically, you've got four new iPhones. Uh, you have the mini, then you have the 12. So they're all iPhone 12s. You have the mm -hmm. iPhone 12 mini, which is actually the smallest, most compact um, 5G phone that available, that's available today. Mm -hmm. um, it does not lose any of the features of the standard iPhone 12 has the same camera processor, connectivity, everything, in a smaller body. So that's gonna be very popular. Um, then the iPhone 12, then there's the iPhone 12 Pro and the iPhone 12 Pro Max. Um, and all four models support 5G. And in the US, all four models have millimeter wave, which wow. is quite the achievement um, because a small body phone is very difficult to do both low band and millimeter wave. There's just, the real estate isn't there. So mm -hmm. Apple probably did some magic there uh, on the mini. Um, only the US model will be millimeter wave. All other models will be just sub six. Yeah. Uh, Canada and Japan get their own model and the rest of the world gets their own model as well. So there's three different SKUs and within every SKU there's four phones. Um, so there's a total of 12 SKUs overall of the iPhone, um, mm -hmm. but all of them support 5G. And um, there's the reality is there's gonna be support for um, mid band as well in the US. So 
um, this is going to be a future proof kind of device where um, if you're on Verizon or AT&T uh, and as they start rolling out the spectrum, you just will need kind of like a radio update with a software update to your phone. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's a really great thing for users. Um, and at the same time, you know, I mentioned earlier, they talked about 5G 72 times during the, the press conference. So 5G was obviously the number one feature for the iPhone 12. Right. And um, I think it's a long time coming. You know, some other competitors are already on their second and third generation of 5G phones. Sure. Um, so Apple is behind, um, but you know, in typical Apple fashion, um, they came out swinging and um, they didn't really substantiate a lot of their performance claims. Mm -hmm. um, but they did talk about, you know, you know, peak gigabits per second. I think they said 3.5 uh, is where they're at right now, but they might even be getting four on Verizon. So um, it'll be interesting to see what real world performance numbers are like, um, both on millimeter wave and sub six compared to uh, Android phones. Um, I think that's a long time comparison that people are waiting to do. Uh, mm -hmm. And I fully intend on being one of those people who do it. Yeah, yeah. You know, the mini is interesting and I'd love to get your, you know, your take on this, you know, my thought, my initial thought is like, hey, you know, that form factor might be really ideal, um, you know, for activities like, you know, sports and boating and skiing and that sort of thing. I mean, wh where do you think the desire is coming from, you know, for a smaller form factor? You know, Palm introduced this mini tiny little phone, um, you know, unlocked, you know, sold directly through their, their right. website. But I, I, I'd, I'd love to get your take on, you know, where you think the applicability is for a smaller format phone. So uh, I think the smaller phone, um, first of all, women, women have smaller hands. Um, so they like smaller phones and lots of phones have gotten really big and lots of people are now using their pinkies to hold up the size of their phone and they have <laughs> indentations in their pinkies because they're doing it. So right. I think having a phone that fits in your, in your hand comfortably is, is, is a, an ephemeral uh, desire. Yeah. Um, but I, I think having a smaller phone, I personally, I love having a big screen, but I hate having to hold a big screen. Mm -hmm. um, so I like having a foldable, like, you know, the Galaxy Fold where it's skinny and then it unfolds into something bigger. But obviously iPhone doesn't have a foldable. Uh, yeah. So the best thing you can do is make it a compact device with a very big screen. Um, so I think there's a lot of people who want something like an iPhone SE size without having the giant bezels, right. um, want to have a compact phone that's no, whole, no compromises in the performance and features. And I think that's what the mini is. It's really a no compromises device that really fits everyone's hand. Yeah, no, I, and I, you know, I like the form factor. I mean, I think personally, you know, if I'm going to the beach or if I'm skiing or doing whatever, it's just more pocketable. Uh, but I, you know, I've, you know, I've been a fan of the Samsung, you know, uh, Note products as well as uh, the iPhone Max. So it'll be interesting to see um, customer acceptance. And by the way, you get the award for the $10 award today, ephemeral. You know, that was beautiful, beautifully done, Angel. <laughs> Let me move to my third topic this week. and. Qualcomm. So Qualcomm will be doing their 5G summit. You and I have attended many years um, in, in Spain um, and uh, they'll be doing it virtual this year. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward next week. You know, we've been pre-briefed on some things and I think you're going to see, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, some pretty interesting things from Qualcomm. We were both on that call earlier. In, any, any thoughts there after uh, we finished that call? Um, I think it's going to be very interesting. We have to be careful because um, it's under embargo until yeah. the 20th, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, Qualcomm's 5G Summit is always um, where the company tends to make pretty big announcements around um, technology that enables the growth of 5G. Mm -hmm. um, and they've done a lot of modem announcements in the past there. Yeah. Um, and they've also done some infrastructure announcements. So I would expect probably a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, they you know, they're the leader in 5G when it comes to technology. Um, you know, Apple is using their 5G modem in their phones today. Mm -hmm. um, and so are most Android manufacturers. And there's a possibility even um, Huawei may, if Huawei goes with Qualcomm chipsets, yeah. if they're allowed to. Um, so they're kind of the leader in the technology space. So I think that whatever they are going to announce next week will be um, really important for the industry in terms of long-term growth and sustainability. Yeah, I agree. You know, they, they are really driving the 5G ecosystem. So I'm, I'm looking forward, you know, uh, to Cristiano's keynote and, you know, learning more. There'll be several tracks here that, 
Angela and I will have access to, and um, you may see some Forbes write-ups uh, in the near future, so stay tuned there. So let's move to your last topic this week, and it's, uh, you know, I've been following this this week as well. It's all about 6, 6G and a new alliance, right? Yeah, so there's a new alliance uh, called the Next G Alliance, uh, which seeks 6G leadership, um, which is kind of a uh, organization that the Alliance for Telecommunications and Industry Solutions, ATIS, uh, has launched. Um, and they are working with, wait for it, AT&T, Bell Canada, Ericsson, <laughs> Facebook, Interdigital, JMA Wireless, Microsoft, Nokia, Qualcomm, Samsung, TELUS, Telinx, T-Mobile, US Cellular, and Verizon. So well pretty much all the, most of the U, big North American carriers yeah. and infrastructure providers. Um, they said there are more names coming, but basically it's kind of like a, um, an acknowledgement that there needs to be a path from 5G to 6G mm -hmm. um, and collaboration and cooperation as to what, you know, the carriers and the technology providers need to do um, to make that transition smooth. Um, and I think also to um, be able to leverage the right infrastructure um, in time for, um, you know, what, what's needed for the industry, because yes. it's, gonna be a, it's gonna be a decade thing, right? We're not gonna see 6G for quite some time, right. um, but I think it's important that um, we have standards bodies, um, but there's also pre-standards conversations that need to occur um, amongst the companies uh, to agree to what they should bring into the standards. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, and academia is gonna be involved as well. I think I've spoke to this on a prior podcast and I also wrote a Forbes article um, I visited my alma mater at the University of Texas at Austin, and they have an organization um, that's focused on advancing, you know, sort of the next generation of cellular connectivity. Um, Qualcomm is actually a sponsor um, on campus there here in Austin, Texas. And, um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, you, you'll see a lot of um, academia jumping in, you know, as well. And it'll, it'll be exciting and interesting to see, like, what 6G has in store as far as infrastructure and how you know it's going to continue to lower latency and improve throughput so it'll be interesting so hey another great podcast this week Angela why don't you take us home we hope that our viewers and listeners found this week's topics interesting if anyone out there would like to provide us with insight on a specific 5g topic uh, for a future podcast please reach out to us on social media will is at will found tech and i'm at Anshel Saad. we hope you have a great weekend and please tune in again next week